What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Collider Jedi Council. I'm Christian Harloff, a.k.a. Darth Harloff Minor. Sitting next to me first, he is going Sigh. into... You're, it's not your turn yet. Yeah, <laughs> sitting next to me, he is Mark Yodi Riley. Hello, Yodes. Uh, hello, I'll do it for you, John. Sigh. <laughs> How's it going? May the Force be with you, Council. Happy to be here. The Psy Master himself, you have Obi-John Kenobi, John Campion. Good to be here today. Always ready to talk Star Wars. And coming back, joining us once again, it's Grand Moff Nemiroff. There she is. Perry, hello. Got my namesake with me today. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, Moff oh yeah. Is he be, he's fastly becoming your favorite character. He really? He? I mean, now that I've read the book, yeah, yeah I like having that understanding of the oh, character. You got I'm talking. Oh, I did. Oh, yeah. nice. I did. How I'm, on, I'm a, on to Death Troopers now. How great of a writer is James Lucino? He's like that, one of my favorites. That book is something else. Yeah. Well, he, you know, he's the one who he's writing the Rogue One, mm -hmm. um, not the novelization itself, but the the, the pre, prequel. The, yeah, yeah. The prequel to Rogue One. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that's not time for talking about kind of stuff. So let's move <laughs> on. First, it's time for Star Wars movie news. Everything happening in the world of movie news. The council is going to talk about it, and there's tons of stuff to talk about. All right. So Riley, what's up first? All right. We got some news for the young Han Solo spinoff. As we know, we have Alden Ehrenreich as the scruffy, nerfy, uh, nerfy. scruffy, nerfy, scruffy, lurking. Nerfy, nerfy. Yeah, I can't even say it. <laughs> okay, JTE. Yes, I know. <laughs> it's happening. There's a lot of conversations here. Uh, okay, so we have three names have popped up for the female lead. We have uh, Creed star Tessa Thompson. We have Power Rangers Naomi Scott. And we have Zoe Kravitz. They're all testing in London for Lord and Miller. So what do you think, Christian? Is this, as everybody is now speculating, Sana Solo? Uh, I think too many people are just guaranteeing it's going to be Sana Solo, and I and had I heard first of all, it's, it's, she's Sana Solo because of that initial run where you thought in the comic book. For those people who don't know, that you heard of this character who appeared in the Star Wars comic book that she was claiming to be Han Solo's wife, and everybody lost their minds. This would just totally disregard everything we know about Han Solo, and we said it. We said, it just wait. It's going to be revealed that there's something else to it, and there certainly was. And they had done some runs together, and they had to do this kind of sham marriage. So whatever. The, now the case is, is this her? If you would have told me that it was Zoe Kravitz and Tessa Thompson that were the only two up for the role, then I would say it's got a good chance. Naomi Scott throws it off for me because Sana is a, a, a black character. So... I, and Naomi Scott is, I believe she's of, I don't know what kind of Indian, she's of Indian descent, but she's not, I don't know, Native American. I'm not sure exactly what she is, but I don't think she is black. You're looking but, at me like I had the answer. I think well, I told do, you she was British. Well, you, do, yeah, well, you do all the news, I, but she is British, but I just don't, I'm not sure. So anyway, but unless they're going to go a different direction with the character and then they're going to say, okay, maybe she is, but I don't think she is. Now, do I think she is the love interest they are reading for the love interest? Yes. But if we jump back into the Sana thing and they are going there, and if that is the character, I think that it would be cool to set it all up. And I'm not just squashing it and saying, no, 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 like, like Jar Jar is not Plagueis or is not uh, Snoke. This to me is something that is possible and I would like to see Tessa Thompson if it is indeed Sana. I'd like it to be Tessa Thompson. If it's not, I'd like to be Tessa Thompson. So, um, Campy, what do you think? Well, I mean, uh, who should it be out of those three? It should yeah. be Tessa Thompson. Yeah. Yeah. And if somebody brought up on Movie Talk earlier today, it might have even been you. Like, Tessa has Thor Ragnarok coming up. I mean, she's also in Westworld on, Dennis, on there yeah. right now. She's got a good role going on. It was Dennis brought up. And bring up the fact that, like, look, she's already in the Disney family. Yeah. She's working with Disney right now. She's got a lot of momentum. She's got some big projects. And she killed it in Creed. I completely reject the notion that she's uh, Sauna, yeah. Sansa, Sansa, whatever we're going to call her at this point. I completely reject it. Look, the notion that it's a black girl. There was a black girl once in a comic book. Right. Must be the same person. I, I reject that 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 form of logic or that form of thinking. Besides, that wasn't even a character that went anywhere, or, and that storyline didn't play out. Didn't play out so well, and it turned a lot of people off with the initial introduction of it and all that kind of stuff. And we anticipated. I remember the first time that came up, we said, "You know what? This is going to be like that episode in Firefly, where uh, where uh, where Nathan Fillion's character he gets told he was married because of something right. he did. We we thought it was going to be something like that, and that's the way it turned out. L look, there was a black girl once in a couple of issues of a comic book. This is a black actress, actresses. I, that's way too far of a jump. I reject the notion that it's going to be her. 
I don't think it's her, but the only reason I'm going to disagree with you there is just two things. One, I think that the character actually did, the, the angle didn't go anywhere. The character itself actually right. started to, even the interactions that she had with Leia down the line, really worked, and she's a pretty strong, cool character. The other thing is that I think that if they used her, it would work not only because she's a black character, but the fact that you have, um, the, it, the timeline kind of matches up because they talk about, in the comic book, they talk about these scenarios that have happened back when if we saw some of those not necessarily those specific scenarios but when they used to solo and Sonny used to kind of run together and be in the same circle it would be a nice little nod back to you and I two or three years ago talking about how we nice little nods to fans that read the canon stuff sure yeah that mm -hmm. if you threw that in there and you said oh cool you don't have to go down that wife angle for sure I'm just saying it could make sense I mean there's, there's a reality and there's a way you could do where it could but this remind it smells a, this is what it smells like to me it smells a lot like the moment John Boyega got cast and what did everybody say right. Mace Windu's he's, son either Mace Lando. or Lando, Lando Calrissian's son, son. Lando. Right. it's gotta be why because he's a young black man he's right. gotta be Lando Calrissian's son this smells look I, I'm, I'm dismissing it out of hand as if it's completely impossible obviously not we've seen that they're picking a little bit yeah. out of the extended well it's what what we now call extended universe, not the legend stuff, but but the books and the comics, they are picking stuff out of there and using them in the feature films because it's all in canon, it's all in continuity. So does the possibility exist? Yeah. Absolutely, it does. But I really don't think they're going to do it. Perry, let me throw a what if at you here. Okay. Because the solo movie was even was a movie that they were planning to do before Episode Seven, before Lucas even sold everything off. The solo spinoff movie was something they were planning to do. They knew, they knew this. They knew this was going to happen. When all the new canon stuff and the story group met, did they maybe tell the story the, the uh, people over at Marvel to throw Sana in there because they knew she was going to appear in a movie down the line? You never know. But again, like, like you said, if you think that that's the character they're casting and you look at this group and then you look at exactly what the character looks like in the comic, it's like if that was introduced then and that was their end game, you need to cast for that specific look because you've already established what sure. the character looks like. So I am leaning against this being the role that they're casting right now. And I kind of hope it isn't. I would like to see one of these three up and coming actresses get to jump into a movie like this and get to make the role their own and not be beholden to something that is already out there. But with the three of them, Obviously, if you came up to me and you're like, who would you want to see in a Star Wars movie? At this point, who wouldn't pick Tessa Thompson, given the kind of movies she's made? And she's got the most robust uh, resume of all of them. Naomi Scott, she's coming out in Power Rangers, so we'll see what she's capable of there. The other two credits to her name were The 33 and The Martian. I've seen both of them. I don't remember her in them. No. And then let's not underestimate Zoe Kravitz, because... Even though Zoe Kravitz doesn't have a creed, she's not coming out in Thor and Westworld, she's a pretty damn good actress. She's had small roles in Mad Max. She's, you know, even if you don't like the Divergent movies, she's pretty good in them. Dope. Uh, dope. dope. She's she great really in dope. dope. She's yeah. also in Good Kill, which wasn't the best movie, but I thought she did a really great job in that role. So, you know what? If it's Tessa Thompson or Zoe Kravitz, I don't think I'd be all that disappointed. I hate the fact that I'm arguing with all the council here today, but... The other thing that I wanted to say is that you said that you'd hate to see her, you want to see her make the character her own. But look at what they're doing with Forrest Whitaker. He's certainly making Saw Guerrera his own in Rogue One. He's going to take elements of that character. I think that there is something intriguing. That's why I'm not, I'm not against it because I kind of think that to see what they put on the comic book, someone that I've never seen in the film before that maybe a lot of people who aren't reading the comics, then you'd have an actress like Tessa Thompson turn Sana, Sana into an actual character that comes to life in front of me in the silver screen. That's something that I would actually encourage. I just don't know if they're going to do it. Riley? Well, I think, yes, she could be Sana Solo. I think it would be interesting to see them actually utilize a character from the comics to kind of have that cross-promotion. But the, the fact of the matter is Disney is doing something amazing, and that's diversity. They're expanding yeah. this. This has more to do with, I think, diversity than anything else and what i like what you said perry i would like to see a new character and this is a female lead and i just think that we're going to get and they're they're going to choose the best character possible or the best actress possible i think it's tessa thompson what everybody has said thor ragnarok she's in the marvel uh, the disney family now so she's going to come in there and i just we do it with these comics we do it with these television shows we do it when we say that 
Finn is Lando's son, making this universe so damn small. Why can't we just have a new character and one of color, which is even better? So this is where I think they're going with it. All right, what's next? All right. We got Felicity Jones. She talked a little bit about her first day on the job of Rogue One, and she took a picture of a stormtrooper on a camel. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. That is pretty cool. What she said was she sees this stormtrooper on a camel. No, they're not. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe the camel is Star Wars canon. So what uh, they're probably going to digitally replace it with. Space camel. Maybe yeah. a, a do-back, uh, maybe that, that would conjure to mind the Tatooine. Um, yeah. The stormtroopers looking for the droids. Or it's just a cast member on a camel. Well, this picture in particular <laughs> is actually a fan. He's This is not oh, her go. picture. This is uh, Star Wars fan Scott Loxley riding a camel and Broom Australia. She just came out and said there was a stormtrooper on a camel, so they pulled this picture. Isn't it great that they <laughs> have Google images that can actually pull a camel? So she just talked a little bit about what it's like to be uh, on the set. She realized at that very moment, oh my God, I'm in a Star Wars movie. So what did you think about that? I love it. I mean, her enthusiasm has been pretty cool to listen to in everything. And, and just, the, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what Jyn Erso is going to be all about. But the, the Stormtrooper on the camel, I agree with you. You're going to have like some kind of CGI new creature. But yeah. what I love about it is, and we've known this already from everything they teased so far, is that we're going to see Stormtroopers on like a beach front and mm. i want to see a oh, star wars war on a beach we haven't seen that before we haven't seen that kind of really like whatever the creature is and what kind of battle it's going to be and it reminded me of kind of like a normandy type battle in the star wars universe that's the exciting thing i got from this story is just what's going to be brand new and i don't remember who i was talking to yesterday yesterday about it but the rogue one has the potential to be the coolest star wars movie ever it does. Because it does. it's so brand new as far as this shift from the saga and incorporating things that we're so familiar with, yet so unfamiliar with at the same time. Um, so I really want to see what they're going to do with this movie. I get so excited to hear th anything about it. So fingers crossed. Perry, what say you? Good for her. I love hearing about people's excitement about being a part of this franchise. As for a stormtrooper on a camel, cool. Yeah. I like stormtroopers. I'm psyched about the shore, the shore troopers, about the death troopers, and a stormtrooper riding a camel. I'm fine with that, too. At this point, I am just so hyped about Felicity Jones because I just saw Monster Calls. I'm allowed to talk about it. Yeah. And so really just anything she does at this point, I'm 100% in. She, she plays gonna, the mother in that, right? She does. Yeah. She is going to have one heck of a December. Mm. Uh, this is probably your new Apes on Horses. Stormtroopers on camels. <laughs> yeah, you got to get the I next t-shirt made of that. Look, it's as Star Wars fans, we this is the key moment. This These are the moments and these are the types of quotes that allow us to celebrate and live vicariously through these actors. When they tell their stories about oh my God, I realized I'm on set of a Star Wars movie. It's in those finite moments that we find ourselves living vicariously through them because we now imagine, the moment we read these, we imagine ourselves. What if we walked one foot onto the set of a Star Wars movie and how would we feel And we hear her communicating those feelings back to us? That's the coolest part about little stories like this. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I, I agree with that. And I I look at this, the nerdy guy in me that loves Star Wars looks at this, and you notice when camels walk, they kind of do this thing, yeah. right? So That's how you walk, too. Normally. And that's how I walk. Yeah. So I, I, I speak, I, I know what I speak of. So <laughs> I like the idea that they're going to have to now create digitally a creature that walks that way. So what is that going to look like? Yeah. I mean, I go right into it going, okay, ooh, it's a camel. Why'd they choose a camel and not a horse? Why did they do it that way? So that's just fun to see. Yeah. I, I love these behind-the-scenes images. Cool. All right, what's next? All right, we have some concept art coming from Rogue One, and it's the new image that was found on the back cover of the art of Rogue One, a Star Wars story, uh, and it is a picture of a huge Star Destroyer over the planet Jedha. So have you looked at the image, uh, Christian? What did you think of this? Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, it's, it's just, it, it, as we get closer and get these images, and we know that Rogue One's right around the corner, everything, and everything I see... I, Yes, more, 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 more. But another reason I get excited, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more, is when I, um, I'm going to talk about the Ahsoka novel. And that, there's a lot of talk about this, the ships kind of hovering over different planets and, and how much occupation that the Empire has over the, the course from like Sith up until, you know, even when we're watching through Rebels and, yeah. and episode four. And to hear so much more about it, there's so much 
so much history now coming in, you know, Star Wars history coming through all these, and you see an image like that and the occupation of what the Empire has done. I love this image. I think it's amazing. How about you? Yeah, you, you, you said something that's interesting. We haven't seen the occupation, yeah. okay? So when we're in New Hope, even in Empire and Return of the Jedi, we've never seen the Star Destroyers in particular break orbit, okay? So now, just having that presence over any planet, you know the Empire is there, and they are in full force. So for me, I look at that and it goes back to even what you said with Rogue One, could be the coolest Star Wars movie we ever get because of this concept. I love seeing this. It's it's the occupation of the huge villain that we've all come to love. This just gets me more and more excited. Grand Moff? I just love seeing the scale of a Star mm. Destroyer next to a building. And you also have some TIE fighters in there because that's not something we see very often. And that's something they've made a point of in the trailers for Rogue One too, mm -hmm. is just show to show ships next to the Death Star. So I like to be able to see how it compares to something on the ground like this. That's, it's a freaky looking image when you could see how that chain, how that scale of the Star Destroyer compares to the building and just how one ship could kind of overshadow, cast a shadow over such a, a big expanse of space there. John? Meh. Come on. No, man. I mean, look, it's <laughs> like it's it, look, everybody knows it is well documented how excited I am for this movie, okay? I am. I mean, Armand White today. Uh, yeah. This is a, what? Because I disagreed with you on your stupid little theory? <laughs> you love this image. Come on. Uh, you don't love this? No I, no, I would love the image if it wasn't something I'd kind of already seen before. Like, yeah. I, I, that's, I, that's the only thing. Like, I, I get it. I'm super pumped for that. I can't believe I'm jumping out of my skin. It's a good image, It's but it's not really anything I haven't seen kind already. Kind of like a reverse shot of the one behind. Exactly, yeah, it's exactly what I'm it. talking about. We've seen that shot, and I had all the feelings you guys are describing. Those are the feelings I had when I saw that live, live, live action image. Those are the exact same feelings I had. But so when I see this one, I go, okay, yeah, I kind of saw that. So just to be honest, yeah. I, I like the picture, sure, but it's nothing now, new I, to me. That's a fair point. All right, uh, what's next? All right, if we can't get you excited for that, John, how about <laughs> this next image? Because I sure am excited. There is a Russian poster out there that is teasing a PG-13 rating for Rogue One. Now, we don't have the rating just yet. Makes sense if there's a PG-13 rating. But this is the Russian poster. It has the 12 plus, which is the PG-13 rating in Russia or Europe or wherever. So this image here, I love it. What do you think? The coolest. It, it is, is a, amazing. It's I cool. love it. Uh, the PG-13 is the part of the story. I, it's that, I'll, then I'll pull from Campy and go, eh, because we, we know that. <laughs> kind of no-brainer. We know it's going to be PG-13. Yeah. We know it's going to be a darker movie, and there's gonna, there has to be a lot of death in it because a lot of these people are going to make it out because we don't know where the hell they are in episode four. So you're dead. Um, but it's the picture. It's the photo of really saying it's not going to end well for a lot of these rebels they're, they're going to do okay with the mission we know that they do if you read the, the opening crawl in episode 4 they win their first major battle in this movie we know that that's going to happen and we're going to meet some of the cast of characters that help make that happen but it's that dire those dire moments you know are coming mm -hmm. I mean the helmet this, the, the tragedy that is about to happen to the, the rebels it, it's, it's imminent so I love it. I love, love, love this picture, John. Meh. Oh, oh damn. It's, I tried. I tried. It's, it's a hat on the beach. You Not kidding. Uh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. And I'll tell damn you why. It. I'll tell you why this is great. This is why this is great. I, I say this about movie posters all the time. I really appreciate poster art that in a single frame encapsulates a part of the spirit of you the movie, it, right? right? You look at this image. You're seeing, like, you don't see a severed head, but you see a fallen rebel soldier. You That's see, the Normandy feel. It does. Yeah. You see the oncoming might of the Empire and a lone rebel, clearly, probably fallen soldier there. It says so much. Totally. I love this poster. Look, we know this isn't going to be the final poster. We, we get that. You're going to see, in traditional Star Wars fashion, you're going to see main characters on the poster. I get it. But if this were... In some twisted world, the final poster that we we're gonna, I'd be perfectly fine with. I dig this poster a lot. Yoda lady, Yoda lady, Yoda lady who? Yes, <laughs> I like that. Very nice. It's very Star Wars. Yeah, very Star Wars. This is one of those posters uh, that I would frame and put on my wall as like a collector's piece because it's the Russian version. Mm -hmm. I love it. Exactly what you said, John. You get everything from this image. Just this one image. I love the upside down. Even the upside down rebel symbol yeah. is yeah. is telling you that 
things are going to go upside down for our heroes. And I love this. This is like framing my Revenge of the Jedi poster because it has that little revenge instead of return. This being the uh, the Russian version, I love it. I just, I have to, if I frame this poster, though, it means the movie is so good that I'm going to watch it over and over again. If the movie's meh, then hmm. I won't frame it. Oh, wait, well, a quick quick question about yeah. the, just a little bit of a side note, that Revenge of the Jedi poster. If, yeah. if memory serves me right, is not the other error in that poster also, is Luke not holding a red lightsaber in that poster? It's reversed, yeah. I remember that, yes. Vader has a blue lightsaber and and uh, Luke has a red. That's it's worth so, something. It's fascinating. Hmm. Yeah, it's just a reprint. They mm. just, oh, it's a yeah. reprint, okay. I tried to get originals? I tried to get one of the originals that I saw in Colorado and it was like three thousand yeah. dollars or something. And I was like, yeah, not today. So. Uh, Perry? I love this image. I would like one on my wall as well if I have any wall space left in my office soon. But it, this just connects to what we were talking about with the with the other image, the concept art there. It just highlights the scale of the occupation. You see this this helmet just lying there in the water, and look at what's lurking in the background. So many stormtroopers, so many walkers. I mean, I just love all of the art. I love the visuals, and based on these visuals. God, I have all the hope in Gareth Edwards to deliver a stunning movie. All right, what's next? All right, and a big shout out to our friends at Star Wars News Net. Dot com. They take all the stories out there in the Star Wars universe and Star Wars canon, put them all right in a nice, neat spot. So this next one comes. Walt Disney Records will release the official soundtrack for Rogue One, a Star Wars story, on December 16th. You can pre-order that uh, starting, uh, where does it say? No, it'll be released on December 16th. I thought you could pre-order it. But anyways, as we know, Alexander Desplat left, so we're going to get this Star Wars soundtrack with Michael Giacchino. 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 Right? Okay, good. I think we worked that out. So, yeah. yeah. Are you going to buy this? Uh, no, but that's Why not. not. Well, because the thing is, I don't know what it sounds like yet. And I don't buy scores. And I sp and it's funny because we're talking about this. And we mention it all the time. I stopped buying soundtracks or looking at s before, because of the Phantom Menace yeah. and the spoiler of the Qui-Gon thing. When that happened, the, if you didn't know, they, they say like Qui-Gon's noble end on the... And it it's, 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 you sons of bitches. I still so remember and that. They, and they pre-sold it and I was like, oh, so I guess he dies. Um, <laughs> but... I also want to see, you know, there might be some great tracks on there that I'm like going out, definitely buying it. If not, then I'll wait. But I'm not sure. I want to hear the tracks first and I want to watch the movie itself and feel like, oh, this is where, uh, you know, Jenner so does this or this is the first time Saul Guerrero pops in. Depending on how the actual movie <coughs> plays out, that's when I usually go out and buy scores. So I'm not just going to go out and buy it right away because it's Rogue One. I'm not telling you that I'm not going to buy it the second after I see the film, and it. it I, but I, it's for me. It's I like to watch the movie, hear it, envision. Like I, I want to see the scene first because if I don't, and this is also something I did with the Phantom Menace and the other ones. I listened to them first, envisioned what I thought the scenes were going to look like, oh, and then you're setting yourself up for disappointment. And then I was disappointed mm -hmm. when yeah. I'm watching it now. But when any time I, I, I buy a soundtrack or score afterwards. I make sure that I, I'm, I'm listening. I'm like, oh, this is when Superman, Man of Steel goes, the first time he learns how to fly or this. It, it, it just, it, I feel like I'm watching the movie again. So I'm going to wait, but I definitely am excited about it. John? No interest in pre-ordering this. And pre for, for right. a lot of the, the reasons you were just saying, look, a good music score in a movie is not a great piece of music you can tap your foot to. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's not what it is. Listen to Indiana Jones, the theme for Indiana Jones, right? It's, it's a pop, poppy bit of music, but if you haven't seen Indiana Jones, you don't get it. A great musical score is the type of score that when you hear it, it instantly takes you in your mind to that scene in the movie. One of my favorite pieces of score of the last number of years was actually from Man of Steel. Now, wh whether you love or hate Man of Steel, I think it's a magnificent film, but whether you love or hate it, that score do do dun 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 dun, dun he do, came out do, to, to his, la yes, his last match. Yes, he did. Yeah. And when when I that if you just listen to it on its own, okay, that's kind of a cool piece. But when you've seen the film and now you associate the scenery and what's going on, Superman looking out into the up into the sun and flying off through the clouds, and then the movie the music crescendos and it's just, that's when it becomes something special. So and I remember I listened to a few tracks of The Force Awakens before seeing The Force Awakens. It's like, oh, there's nothing special about this. 
I think you felt the same way. Yeah. And then we saw the movie, then listened Makes to the track sense. again, yeah. and now we're there because good musical score is a piece of a puzzle to an overall scene. The music isn't a standalone thing. It's meant to go with and complement and enhance a scene. And if you haven't seen the scene, you're looking at it and listening to it completely out of context. So I, I'm, I'm glad for people who are big fans of music scores and maybe they can get their hands on it first. But to me, it's going to lack the meaning until I see the movie and then it'll be special to me. Perry? I will not be pre-ordering it, but if you are interested, it's available on pre-order right now. Oh, you can okay. actually Thank click and, and get it. Um, the only upside for me at least with buying scores before I see the movie is when I work I like to listen to music sure. but I can't listen to music if I know the words or if I could picture the movie or I'm not going to focus on my work so sometimes I like scores as background noise regardless of whether or not I'm super into the movie but then I have the other case where when I know something well enough and I can transport myself to that place and time, that's when it's really exciting to me. The last thing I had that with was Hunger Games, because the original Hunger Games, because that score to me was just an excellent, excellent score, and it had so much energy to it, and I used to run to it all the time. Right. So, you know, I'm hoping to get a couple tracks <laughs> that give me that kind of feeling here, but mostly whenever I buy scores, too, or if I buy the... Uh, some if they have like great artwork and then I can just like line it up on a mm. shelf somewhere. So I do have a couple of scores like physically owned copies where I'll just leave it out just because I love the art. Rob Riggle. <laughs> I'm getting a lot of new nicknames today. I like this. All right. <laughs> oh my god. And a heart attack on top of that. Um yeah, I'm, I agree with all you guys. I'm not gonna pre order this. I gotta listen to I gotta and see you're the, the scores movie. guy. I'm the scores guy, but yeah, yeah I've never ever pre-ordered or right. listened to a score before a movie. I just don't do it because of everything you guys have said. You can't take it out of context. You got to watch it because then I like going back. I and I like being um, surprised in the movie, like Man of Steel. What a great uh, example because in Man of Steel, that music just hit me like oh, a ton of bricks. So good, so beautiful. The ideal of hope that that tone just I was like oh and then I got it then I listened to it endlessly and and it it's a part of the experience for me yeah. so but I probably will buy 99% sure I'm going to yeah, buy this exactly. after I see the movie the All most right. striking thing about this though is that it makes me realize how quick the turnaround was for him. Because I feel like we were just talking about the change in composer on the movie and all of a sudden it's like, oh, pre-order this thing that he has been working on for how many weeks? I think about I, that. I think, well, that's... It's, that's the announcement think, came later. I think they... Yeah. yeah, I think this is I, one of those situations dear where... God, I hope so. When the Ben Affleck as Batman announcement came out, we later found out he had been cast like yeah. four months right. earlier. It's just, I think that switch probably happened a little bit earlier. Giacchino was working I would on really it hope for so. a while. I think that they just let the information out. That's personally what I think. Um, all right, what's next? All right, so Adam Driver, uh, a few weeks back, mm -hmm. spoke to Col our own Collider, and he referenced the holy grail of Star Wars movies in comparing Episode Eight to The Empire Strikes Back. Now, he's talking to Vanity Fair to clarify these comments, because what he said was he didn't actually compare it to Empire Strikes Back, he compared it to the tone. So he said, no, no, that's not even what I said. What I said was the tone of it was different. I didn't say that it was gonna be in the vein of it, I was using it as an example. So poor example, he clarified. Next time I should say, I, I'm trying to think of another sequel to a movie that's good. When I read the script, it was not one I expected in the best of ways. So what do you think about his clarification of this? I think that's exactly what we thought when we talked about it the first time. It's like we, we never thought, I mean, some people did, but I don't think we thought that he was saying this was going to be Empire Strikes Back and hit the same beats. So that was, he was just saying, if you look, if you compare episode four, and what episode four is a kind of that the hero's journey and and how it's kind of a very it's like a fun space opera western and everything's happy go lucky and then two is just a total shift in tone completely yeah. and it's a different movie empire strikes back yeah you got the same characters in it but it's a different film kirshner did things very differently than what lucas did that is what adam driver was talking about and i think that that's the majority of how all of us read it here, but there were certainly some people who didn't um, see it that way. 
so yeah, I, I got what he was talking about, and you know, you're under a you're under the lens, man, when you're talking s Star Wars. So whatever you say, you got to be super super specific, even though we got what he's talking about. But Riley, what do you think? Yeah, well, look at the, this is the actual quote. It's similar to how the Empire Strikes Back has a different tone. Yeah. That's what he said. Yeah, we we all kind of spoke on this, but every single it's kind of now a pop culture staple with directors that anytime they're directing a second movie and a sequel or a franchise, they compare it to The Empire so Strikes this Back. This will be our Empire Strikes Back. This is our back. Empire Strikes yep. Back, yeah. The only person that didn't do that was Joss Whedon, because I don't think he even likes The Empire Strikes Back. But <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm excited. I don't want Empire Strikes Back. I want a different tone, I want a new direction, and Ryan Johnson is the man to do it, so I'm glad that he's clarifying. Um, I, I, I love that he's trying to, he's like, okay, what's a sequel that is really good that I could compare it to. He couldn't even pull that, which to me is a little telling that this might be one of the most different sequels in the Star Wars movie uh, franchise, maybe ever, I don't know. We have some big things that happened by the end of Force Awakens. I am so fascinated to see where we're going now. There's no government right now. Right. Where are we gonna go? So I love that it's a different tone. I've heard rumors or maybe even quotes from Ryan Johnson that he's he really went out there that Disney let him do what he wanted to do with this in the writing of it. So I, I'm fascinated. I can't wait. I'm glad he clarified. Perry? Yeah, this story just makes me sad for actors in these <laughs> movies because they it's like a lose-lose kind of situation. The second year cast, you know the questions are coming if you have movies coming out. There's no way around it, and it almost seems like we're at a point where there's no right thing to say. No matter what you say, someone's going to twist and turn it, and not to knock the outlets that cover this because then you got to think, you know, they're trying to run a website and a business too, and there's a thing called a headline, and there's a thing called SEO, and you do need to come up with a headline to sell a story in a certain amount of words. And this quote in particular is very easy to morph into Adam Driver compares episode eight to The Empire Strikes Back. That that just is the headline. So I, I don't know who's at fault in a situation like this, but I'm hesitant to point a finger at anyone because everyone's kind of just doing their jobs in this situation. Right. You know, yeah. we're all so passionate and we all want to know what's coming. So these kinds of things are inevitable. So I wish there was a way around it, but this is probably one of many that's coming our way in the very near future. John? Yeah, look, I'm usually somebody who gets really upset when I see people manipulating headlines for it. But even I will say... Sites that would that ran Adam Driver compares episode eight to Empire Strikes Back. I got no beef with that because he, in the literal terms, that's what he did. Right. The question is, what was he comparing about Empire Strikes mm -hmm. Back? He wasn't comparing the quality of Empire Strikes Back. He wasn't comparing the themes of Empire Strikes Back. He was comparing the difference from its original as, as episode eight. That's what he was comparing. Mm -hmm. And we knew that when we first talked about this story. It's like, look, look, you know, all he's saying is, it's like Empire Strikes Back in the sense that it's going to be a totally different movie. Right. Now, I'm sure he got a tongue lashing once mm. he said that and that got it. I'm sure Adam Driver got a tongue lashing be for a couple of reasons. Number one, and most importantly, because Empire Strikes Back is the gold standard. Yeah. When you're talking about a follow-up film, a sequel, what have you, it is the gold standard. And if you start going out and saying, this is the next Empire Strikes Back, you're giving ammunition to people to fire at the right. movie later. So they want to be very careful about that. I get it. I understood what he was trying to say. I think it was smart for him to come out and clarify it anyway, but I, I hope this puts that all to rest. All right, well, that's everything in Star Wars movie news. Now it's time to get into... What's the deal with canon? Yeah, I'm back. Uh, <laughs> we have a lot of things to talk about in canon today, and this is everything, if you're not familiar with what canon is, it's essentially everything that ties into the Star Wars lore, the movies, if you will, that aren't the movies. So you're going to have comic books, video games, uh, novels, whatever those might be, we're going to talk about them. Riley, what's up first? And we have TV shows like Star Wars Rebels. So in an interview with Empire Online, uh, Dave Filoni was speaking a little bit on how close a time frame are we getting in Rebels 
to Rogue One. And he gave a, a very de- a lot of detailed responses. I'll, I'll read a little bit of it. He said, I would say that there will be things that definitely have influenced each other and have been definitely accounted for. Something that I've been interested in is I've been aware of the kind of the look of the film and the characters in the film for a while. If you look at Rogue One, it's much more gritty and very realistic looking world. And in Rebels, it is a much more, when it starts out, colorful world. Uh, colorful world. I've been slowly adapting because I've been in the know so that as we get closer to each other, things are going to be naturally lined up. So what did you think about these comments? He also talks about how great Sam Witwer was as Darth Maul and how they're getting to Meh. expand on his character. <laughs> <laughs> I'm setting you up, John. I'm setting Meh. you up for Sam Witwer. You know him, right? Yeah, he's doing a schmo down soon. Or he uh, did a schmo down. He's doing another one. We'll talk about that. You need somebody yeah, yeah. to fetch the coffee, I guess. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> make notes of these because I need sound bites. Uh, all right, guys. So look, here, here's the thing with Filoni that we know the man is the master of fan service mm-hmm. in in a way in that, a good way in a great way not a fan service was all they're asking for it so we've got to give it to them not that this is someone who knows what the fans enjoyed and what worked what worked in the lore prime example of that is now we we've got um Oh my God! I'm just, I can't believe that I uh, Thrawn. I just completely. I, I got Tarkin in my head because there are there, a but, million Star Wars names. It's okay if you have a pause no, for a second. No, but it was it was because of the Tarkin thing. But Thrawn. Blame we, Tarkin, why don't yeah. I know I should. Everybody but we, blames Tarkin. We for might as well. People but forget things all the time. Bespin. Bespin. But we're bringing. <laughs> that's nice. See, that's a shot for you tomorrow. But we got Thrawn now, and that was because you had and and he kept teasing that through Legends and a couple weeks before Celebration, he, he had tweeted out this picture, and then the background was Zahn's book, and he been working with Zahn. He knows. What pops, and the reason I bring all that up is because the fans have also been asking f- for what's happening with Rogue One. At Celebration, not this past Celebration, but the one before, Kiri Hart was asked about Rogue One and Rebels, and she's like, what will we see? And she's like, we're very aware that of that time period is around the same time period that we are playing with. They're not gonna ignore it. There are gonna be things, and if you also look at it time-wise, when we get to season the, we're in season three right now of Rebels, and we'll be like what ten or maybe twelve episodes in of Rebels once Rogue One hits theaters, yeah. close to it. So we're going to know a lot of stuff that happens when Rogue One happens that either is going to lead up or meet some new characters. Krennic will probably pop in to Rebels if he's been around for that long now. Krennic will probably, I don't think maybe, but right beforehand or maybe afterwards, we're going to see things that happen. So they're aware it's going to happen. It's inevitable. You're going to see crossover. I don't necessarily know if you're going to see crossover from characters from the show pop into the movie. Mentions maybe, but I think you're certainly going to see characters from Rogue One and mentions of story points in Rebels. But uh, Perry, what do you think? I imagine we will too, especially when you've got someone like David Filoni spearheading the whole thing. He's shown that he is more than capable of having characters cross over, exist, make mention of, in th- multiple things going on at once, which I love. But my favorite thing about this quote is just how he teases color, how something as simple as that, where it's almost like completely changing the tone of, the, of Rebels and it's getting so much darker. And you could see that it really is matching up with what we've seen in the trailers and what we're going to get in Rogue One. So I think that's just a, a brilliant way to start paving the way before maybe you drop a character like, I don't know if it's possible, but maybe Krennic, where it's like, oh my God, look at this crossover that's happening right now. He's doing the work that you need to do in order to make stuff like that happen. And, you know, in most situations like this, I I can't think of a good thing to name drop, but where you have an opportunity to drop, let's say, a character in a big screen movie in a TV show, it's like, let's just do what feels right at the moment. We'll get fans hyped in the moment. They're just doing such a good job of paving the way and earning it before they do it. John? One of the great things about Rebels and and one of the advantages they have is that, in a sense, it's very closely connected to the Star Wars movie universe we know. So yeah. that's good. So that gives them so uh, that gives them a north star by which to navigate and go. However, it's also distant enough from the movie universe that they have a lot of freedom and flexibility to chase a lot of character arcs, a lot of storylines that won't have any effect on what we know in the rest of canon, right? For example, we have these characters, Ezra Miller, we have Kanan, we have Hera. We have all these characters, right? <laughs> Are any of them mentioned? What do Ed, I say? Ezra Bridger. What Ezra Miller's Miller. a flash. Did I say Ezra Miller? <laughs> yeah. Did I say Miller? Yeah. Hey, well, do, you, do you host a movie show, John? I mean, it's, it might be. <laughs> it might be what did I say? We got a million names going through our yeah. head. Okay, but so here's a beautiful thing. 
You kill, you can kill any of them the next episode. Has no impact on what's going on in the rest of canon. Whereas, let's say C-3PO and R2-D2 were key characters in Rebels. You're a little bit handcuffed. There's there's certain things you can't right. do with them now. The beauty of Rebels is that it's close enough connected with the movies that it matters when you're watching and it feels familiar, yet separated enough from the movies that no hands are tied and they can go and they can p pursue these wonderful story arcs, these wonderful ideas without worrying about what consequence does this have on the movies. It's a brilliant setup that they have over there. It's great. Right. Yeah, and I like this. Uh, you guys, I echo everything you guys say. I'm I'm excited. I love the color palette that it starts with and then excuse me and then how it's changing over time i also love feloni and how he talks about he talked about um ahsoka and her nickname being fulcrum and then using ezra as when ahsoka leaves the fulcrum shift in ezra finding the sith hologram and uh, holocron and then what that means for him so i love that he has these thoughts in his head i can't wait to see just like what you said <laughs> what <laughs> Sorry, completely unrelated thoughts just crossed my head. It was completely Man, unprofessional. That, that was a, like a, a changing lanes in the freeway from yeah. the fast lane to get to the off ramp. Do you want to know what I thought? I'm yeah, just, why, as well. Please. I, just of a, I don't know why. Can, I just thought of a t-shirt. I just thought of a t-shirt I want to make. Can watch this, what were you about to say? Well, no, I, yes, yes. Right. I just thought of a t-shirt I want to make. I want to get a t-shirt with a big face of Sam Witwer on it, and underneath it says, be kind to ugly people. That's what I thought. <laughs> But, uh, I, uh, just, I don't know where that came there's from. There's a gathering storm <laughs> yeah, in the Star yeah. Wars Schmodown universe. It, uh, <laughs> all right, you're, you're, te you're, tempting, you're tempting evil there, buddy. All right, let's let's get to the next story. Uh, all right. <laughs> stay on target. Excuse me, stay on target. All right, let's talk Wedge Antilles because we got a Rebels season three preview where yes, Wedge Antilles is showing up finally. I love it. I cannot wait to see this. So one of the most uh, famous Star Wars <laughs> side characters in the original trilogy is finally making his debut on season three of Rebels. And uh, it's uh, we get a, a little synopsis while undercover as a cadet Sabine meets Wedge Antilles and tells him of her plan to help him escape Imperial clutches for good. And there's a clip that comes for the next Star Wars Rebels uh, episode, Antilles Extraction. What do you think? I'll uh, tell you what, what I think. I'm super <laughs> excited about watching this episode. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been so pumped because, like, for instance, my good buddy Christian comes to me yesterday and yeah. says, hey, dude, well, let's watch this episode together tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm sure, dude, I can't wait. I'm going to wait till we watch this episode together tomorrow, right? That's going to be great, right? I watched it. <laughs> <laughs> then we're uh, having wait. lunch. <laughs> having lunch, I'm like, okay, we're going to watch it this afternoon, right? He goes, I, I kind of already watched it. I know. It. I, I said, I said, I'll, I said, I'll, I said, jackass. I said, <laughs> I said, I'll, I said, I'll watch it again. With, uh, There's a new it. nickname that we just brought up on the show for Look, Christian. I'll tell you what, man. Sufferable jackass. I was, I was sitting there and I was doing the notes for this show and I had the episode and I was supposed to be going to a screening. So I'm, I do the episode. Oh, and, you mean and, that and screening where you're like, yeah, Perry, I'll see you there. Yeah, and then I, I get I, there. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a horrible scumbag. So I, I was going, I was going through the notes. I'm finishing the notes and then I'm like, all ah, right, push play. And then before you know it, I was late to the screening and I had watched the episode. But that being said, I'm also a professional. I can tell you guys that I enjoyed it. Um, look, the thing, <laughs> good. the thing is, the one thing that you should, and without spoiling too much, there is uh, a lot of people were asking about Wedge because they see him here. He's an, he's an Imperial. And you're like, well, in Aftermath, they talk about how his first mission he had got from Fulcrum. And if we know if we've seen season two of Rebels, how could that be if Ahsoka was Fulcrum? What I will tell you is that question is addressed in this episode. Mm -hmm. So they're they're paying attention to everything. So you know, someone said is, the first thing I got was, "Is this a problem with canon? Is this a problem with canon?" They address it. Um, also, so Wedge Antilles, it was it's to say uh, we're going to be do once John finally gets around to being professional and watching the episode, we <laughs> we will actually be reviewing this like we have. If you don't know, we do the Star Wars Rebels recap between myself and David Griffin and John Campia, and we will be doing it again. It's every every Saturday right after the episode when it airs on the East Coast. You can find it here on Collider. And that's why I don't want to spoil the entire thing. But I am—I want to hear your thoughts as far as if you guys are looking forward to it. John, I'll start with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to it. No, I really am. And you know what? The, this whole thing—nobody <clears throat> should be surprised 
about the notion that Wedge was in the Empire. Look, in the, in the Star Wars lore, a lot of the Rebellion military guys actually got their training. Lost stars, in the, I mean, man. I mean, that's that's yeah. the whole universe. You're in the Imperial Army and then the Imperial Navy. That's where a lot of them got their start and then they seeded out of that. So that really shouldn't, shouldn't surprise anybody. Look, ever since they gave us a, a glimpse of Wedge in that season three uh, preview, it's like, hey, it's Wedge. Yeah. The one guy there for the presence of both the d destructions of both Death Stars. This is going to be cool. I've been looking forward to it. So, yes, I am looking forward to watching it alone today. No, I'll watch it with you again. <laughs> Riley? Yeah, I, how can you not be excited for Wedge? I, I love uh, Wedge coming in. He's one of my favorite uh, side characters in all the, the trilogy. So I, I like to get the backstory. I love that he starts out as an Imperial uh, pilot. That makes a lot of sense. A lot of the Rebels did, I think. You know, they, they don't like the Empire, so they defect. So I'm excited. Perry? I am so hyped, especially having read both Aftermath books now and mm. knowing his value later on when he gets older. I really want to see his roots, especially yeah. with how he teaches snaps. So I want to see a little of where he started at that age and where, where he goes on from there. And I just love the line in that clip where he goes, if this is what the Empire is becoming. because. That's why I'm so thankful you turned me on to the books because that's what the books explore more so than yeah. any of the films or even the show. It's just that mentality of someone saying, I want to join the Empire for this reason and then seeing the transformation happen where they realize, uh-oh, you know, this isn't right, but I feel conflicted. What's going on here? So I just want to see more of that. Well, this goes back to George Lucas when he started writing this. That, that was the <laughs> dilemma. Imagine being a, being German in the 19, late 30s and the 40s. I mean, when you see this government, you see it, because Germany being this poor nation, and then this government comes on, and now they're this powerful, and then you realize, well, but how did we get here? Yeah. And that's what this is. That's, it, that is exactly what's starting to happen in the books. Like Lost Stars, you see a mm -hmm. lot of those people yeah. that that happens. I was kind of hoping to see a few of those characters pop up in this episode. They don't, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, it was it. it, it you're absolutely right because there's a mention of it. They explore it so deeply, and on the way over today, and this is why I think that I encourage every Star Wars fan to really get into a, any version of canon, whether it is the novels or comics or Rebels. There is so much more that you feel as a fan if you know these things. Because I was listening to the Darth Vader uh, death. Uh, in uh, the, the score from John Williams from Re Re I was gonna say Revenge of the Jedi Return of the yeah. Jedi and I had watched this thing last night and it was Anakin going to the dark side uh, throughout his arc just the moments that he went through the dark side in the Clone Wars and things that he did also uh, it, was, it was just Ahsoka moments that he had Ahsoka flashing back and moments they had together after I was reading the Ahsoka book and when I listened to that song and then he remembering the scene when Vader dies it meant more to me because I, of, of how much more I was connected to Anakin. The stories that I had heard Obi-Wan talking about Anakin, I see those now and I hear about it, even in the Ahsoka book of how she recalls what Anakin was like. These things, these canon books really do enrich the storytelling and the, the Wedge and Tilly's points you guys are making also. So everybody else, everybody else talked about this. Did you talk yeah. about it? Okay. Uh, all right, what's next? Uh, we have, uh, you spoke about the Ahsoka novel. So yeah. give us your rundown. Uh, how's the book? Well, first of all, I want to thank Lucasfilm uh, Publishing for Lucas, uh, Publishing for sending this my way about a week, two weeks ago. I'm about 220 pages into this thing, and it's about almost 400, uh, 350 pages. So far, so good. What I will tell you guys right now is that if you're an Ahsoka fan, so John will not be reading this book. Mm -hmm. um, it's, this, is, this is for the hardcore Ahsoka fans for sure. If you want to know what happened to her like right after she had left the Jedi Order and where she went and what it was like for her um, in those early years trying to escape, this is that book. There are, it starts, what I really like is how it's very similar to what Obi-Wan had to do is like not use the force, not rely on the force and things to keep herself on the down low so she wasn't exposed. That stuff's very interesting to me. Relationships she has to kind of go in and out of, um, how she has to detach from people because if she makes these attachments, she just has to leave at the drop of a dime to make sure that the Empire doesn't find out who she is. And they have a couple different planets she's got to get to. There's a really cool scene that I'm in right now with, with, um, with Bail Organa, which is, great and has things that he even talking about him and his young daughter that he's got and how he does there's certain things that kind of a reference to i believe that those journals in um in um 
bloodline. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. there's some cool stuff in here for sure. I want to see how it all plays out. There, there's a there's an appearance from a character in Rebels that I thought was very interesting. Didn't see it coming. So there's some cool stuff that ties in. And if you're kind of caught up in some of this lore, uh, I think that you'll enjoy it for sure. I, I, I have to see how it pans out at the end, but I do like E.K. Johnson's writing style. I do feel like I'm, the most important thing for me always when I'm reading these books is, do I feel like I'm Star in the Star Wars world, or do I feel like this is someone who's trying to write Star Wars? This is, I'm in the Star Wars world here. I feel like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm watching like an episode, uh, like a show that aired um, in between Clone Wars and Rebels. So it's cool. It feels like, I, I actually, this is a book though that I will tell people I think that you should do the audio book because Ashley Eckstein does the narration for it. Right. Oh. Yeah. And yeah. you okay. know what I mean? So I, I'm going to, even after I finish reading it, I'm going to listen to it because I want to hear Ahsoka say some of these things. There's a lot of, there's a lot of tragedy in Ahsoka's life. And you, f- you feel it. And there's a really cool line about where she's thinking about Palpatine and talking about Palpatine. And she's like, she had heard r- rumors that there, were, uh, that there was like a dark lord that was serving him also, but nothing to be confirmed. And she's like, oh, that's, that's, that's your guy. Go. That's cool. Uh, it's, so there's some cool stuff. And there's some also, there's some slower moments and things that when she's on this revolt with these other, this the second planet she goes to that I was like, all right, let's, let's move a little bit more. Let's get into more about her. But so far, so good. What about newcomers to the character? It's like, I know her from Rebels, yeah. but I I haven't watched Clone Wars, so am I going to be able to jump into that? And still if you appreciate know it from it? Rebels, yes, I think because if you watch from Rebels and then you go in and visit this book, you'll want to watch Clone Wars okay. because you'll want to be invested even more so than you are. Now, if you <laughs> haven't watched Rebels and if you haven't watched Clone Wars and you follow her, uh, it, it'll be like you won't pick up on a lot of the references. They definitely go. There's a there's a lot of callback to some of the events that happened in the Clone Wars series. There's some lead up happening to Rebels, obviously too. But there's a. I would say that try to watch some of the Clone Wars or Rebels. This is definitely for the fans of Ahsoka, and I think it serves them well. All right, what's next? All right, you have more books I to do. discuss. I do, yeah. I do. So Star Wars: The Complete Location Review. So, yeah. I lost my mind when this thing came out. <laughs> yeah, when they sent DK Publishing sent this to me, by the way, and it is the coolest thing ever. You guys, I will let you guys uh, take a look at this afterwards. And it's all right, everyone, take five. I'm telling you, you get lost. You get lost. Like John, I was going to talk to you about this. Like I, the first thing I well, did. We last were flipping night, through that yesterday. They had the planet profiles right, right in this, and this is Perry can talk about this too because they previewed this thing at Celebration. Mm-hmm. But like, for example, if you have like uh, Naboo, they tell you that it's it, it the length of a year is 312 days. The Ooh, population cool. is. When you hold that page up for yeah. everybody to see, yeah, that. yeah, it's got. So you see that. Good, good shot. Oops. Uh, yeah, so all that stuff. Hey, right. it's. Um, I just want to point out none of those are Harloff Minor. Just, <laughs> no, wanted, no, just no, wanted to no, point that there's out. Only, there's only the film locations. Okay. There's only the film locations. <clears throat> so what you have right here, like you have all the lo- you have all the population, you have everything to you can get lost in this. And then they have like you, it goes page um, movie by movie. So when you go to like R- Return of the Jedi. It takes you into the Emperor's throne room, and there's little things in in um, Yoda's hut and Dagobah. They show you where he keeps his lightsaber, but it's, it's there's you will get lost in this book. It is for That's the cool. hardcore sweaties for sure. Um, go and check it out. I really recommend that. I, I got lost in this book. It is the Star Wars Complete Locations book. And it is great. Thank you for to DK Publishing for sending this to me. But you had heard about this, Perry. Yeah, that was hands down the most striking thing I saw at that panel. When they put up just a couple of pages from the book, you really, not lying at all, you can get lost in it. Not just the whole book, because the book covers a ton of places, a ton of planets, everything, but just even individual pages where there's so much detail. Like one of my favorite pages, I was flipping through it before this, is the, the Hoth one, where you open it up and it's Echo Base inside yes, yes. too. I mean, there, Right there is like four panels that it's can amazing. take you a pretty solid chunk of time to go through. I, I'm telling you, you go, you will get lost in this book, and in a good way. Like you'll just you'll you'll start to list every single thing. There's so much detail in every movie, mm-hmm. and every little location from every page. And you, like, I was just on that planet page alone. I was on it for like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and next thing I know, I'm like, oh, let me figure out what, what what think of a location and or finding out things it's so detailed i love it john's beautiful. already lost Look, it's john, beautiful john's too. Lost in it. yeah he doesn't he doesn't need the this imagery yeah. is really stunning and just the way they present the the information too yep. it's it's where your eyes should naturally go to really understand everything that happens there yeah riley yeah i 
This will look so nice next to my making of The Empire Strikes yeah. Back by J.W. Rinsler because that book I went through took me months. This looks just beautiful. I love the side. John like opened it up like a thirteen year old opening up a Playboy Center. Yeah, yeah, sure. He's like, oh yeah. It's probably at have that. the same physical reaction. It's too. You had a side. You had some kind of side. And look, like I when I got these books, I was like, I don't know, am I gonna like pick this thing up for a little bit and say, all right, that's cool, and then just kind of put it down. It's awesome, man. It really is. It's for it's for the hardcore Star Wars fans. Absolutely. All right, Riley, let's talk about the next one. Yeah, and the last one we have, Year by Year, A Visual History of Star Wars. We got another big, thick book. Look at this. This book is like another one to where what I would suggest for people who are just getting into Star Wars or hardcore Star Wars fans, this reminded me very much of how Star Wars conquered the universe where you are taken oh, yeah. year by year into the history of Star Wars. Like as you start out, it's like the life, the first content is like life before Star Wars. And it kind of gives you like George Lucas living in a Modesto and the car crash and everything kind of leading up to it and, and his early movies and American Graffiti and how Star Wars kind of came to be and going in 1976 to the first Comic-Con and promoting it there when nobody knew the, what the hell it was. And then the explosion, um, the original trilogy, between the trilogies, the prequel trilogy, Clone Wars and beyond Star Wars a new era all of this stuff it is so detailed and so layered Pablo Hidalgo does a big thing in here also there's so much cool stuff like you know, I'm just gonna flip to a page here and I get to uh, oh, I July Clone Wars and beyond and it's like you have um, that oh, that's amazing you have so <laughs> the first thing I pick up is Mark Echo Bass is the first thing that I that I mm. the, the very, very interesting so there's a lot of these cool things in here that I would suggest Checking this out here, it is Star Wars year by year, the visual history. Once again, thank you to DK Publishing for sending this to me. I didn't know what to expect, and no one's going to get their hands on any of this stuff. All right, um, <laughs> now it's time to hear from you guys. It's Twitter time. You guys have sent some stuff out into the world, and if you guys want to do it, just hashtag Collider Jedi Council, and we will get your tweets hopefully on the air. Riley, what are they saying? Titan Dweevil says, will Rogue One... Dweevil, oh. yeah, Dweevil, Titan Dweevil. Uh, will Rogue One make one billion worldwide? I'm going to defer here to John because this is, we've gotten in, in these box office conversations quite often, and he's, he's pretty on the money with this stuff. So, John, what do you think? Billion worldwide? Okay, first off, it, let's, let's be clear. It doesn't have to make a billion dollars to be no. successful. No. Right. There are some people out there who set these ridiculous numbers and say, oh, and if, if it doesn't do this, it's a disappointment. No, no. But I will say a grand number is attached. If it doesn't, like, say, make 675, 700 million worldwide, it'll be considered a disappointment. I do think it'll cross 1 billion. I do. I mean, look, when you look at episode seven, and look, Bob Iger, the grand swami of all things Disney, he got on a call recently with, with their own shareholders and said, look, just so you guys know, we're, this will not do the same numbers that The Force Awakens did. And he's absolutely right, it won't. But it doesn't need to. That made $2 billion. To say that it'll get at least half of what The Force Awakens did, I don't think that's unreasonable. Yeah. So yeah, a billion dollars, I do think that is something they can hit. I think it's gonna happen also, and I think I think domestically, I think it's gonna make just around 400 here, maybe a little more, but I think that we're- I'll, I'll go so far as five. Five? Yeah. But I think that it's, I, the, the reason why one billion dollars is going to happen is this little guy right here darth vader is going to bring butts into the seats yeah. and when you start hearing about what he does in the movie yeah a billion is going to happen now if it doesn't once again i it doesn't mean that it's a failure um and it's it's a it's a different kind of movie don't expect the force awakens numbers it's not going to happen but we are going to see some big numbers for this movie i think a billion is certainly possible I think it's possible and I want it to happen. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of leaning towards no on okay. it. And mm -hmm. I think it's in really good shape when you look at what it's up against in December. It's got, you know, Assassin's Creed, Passengers, and then Sing coming after. Mm -hmm. And I don't think any of those movies are something that's going to take audience away from this. So I think it's in really good shape in that respect. But what kind of tipped the scale for me was looking at the Marvel Cinematic Universe and seeing what happens when something like Avengers comes out and it makes $1.5 And then you go on to Iron Man 3, but it's the third Iron Man movie that made 1.2. Then look at something like like Thor 2, Winter Soldier, and Guardians. This kind of shocked me. I didn't realize that those were so far away from the billion dollar mark. But Thor 2 had uh, 644 million. Hmm. Winter Soldier had seven, 714 million. And then Guardians, which was considered like such a huge, massive hit, that was only 773 million. So 
in my mind, I'm thinking it might come close, but not pass it. Yeah, I loved your facts, Perry, because I think when you brought up Iron Man 3 is a perfect example. It came right after the Avengers, okay? That's why I feel like it crossed that billion dollar mark because people were so, they wanted the next Marvel and Avengers was so good. Same deal here. We got Force Awakens came out, made over $2 billion worldwide. So we're coming into that. So I think it can get very, very close to the billion. I tend to agree with you. I don't think it's going to quite hit it. I think worldwide we're looking at about $900 million. That's where I'm kind of thinking it's going to land. That's not a crazy number, and I think that's certainly possible. Just remember, also remember, Captain America: Civil War um, has made 1.1, and that was a May movie, and it had some time to critically acclaimed. Yes, exactly. Fan love, yes. A successful movie that franchise. Brought yes. all those heroes together, though. We're talking Spider-Man right now too, about now. other than Darth Vader, right. a whole bunch of new people. I, yeah. I don't disagree with you. I, th- I happen to think that's kind of why it might be tough for it to hit the billion, but it's also got the Star Wars name. So Absolutely. Star Wars. And- that's, that's, that's the key. I, I, yeah. That's why I think that the math here works that makes it possible with that billion. Force Awakens made over two. I think an expectation that I could do half of what The Force Awakens did just one year later with a movie that everybody really appreciated and loved, I think making half of what The Force Awakens did is within the reach. Yeah. All right. What's next? All right. Brandon Marsalis writes, not sure if this has been answered on Collider Jedi Council yet, but are we aware of how Ben came into contact with Snoke. We don't know yet how he Oh, came. I know. Oh, you know? I, 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 Something to do with Sam Whitworth. No, I have, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, no, we, uh, we don't know yet. We know that what we do know is if you read Bloodline, it, hap- it has to happen in between five and a half years from The Force Awakens. Because, uh, well, not necessarily, but from what we know in Bloodline, Ben Solo is still traveling around with Luke at this point. That's not to say that Snoke hasn't been kind of poking around. I think that he said he's actually been watching him as a boy at one point. I forget what, what that might have been in the Force Awakens novel. He said he's been looking at him since a boy. So I think, you know, the question is um, exactly how it happened. So now that I hear myself say that, they do mention in the novelization of the Force Awakens that he'd been in contact with him since a boy. We just don't know exactly how it happened. So he's probably very similar to what Palpatine was doing with Anakin, like even in like Revenge of the Sith and in Attack of the Clones where he's kind of counseling him throughout because Leia's certainly aware of him. Because remember, it, it, it wasn't him, it was Snoke. Yeah. So was Snoke trying maybe posing at one point as a helper, as a good person? We don't know, and I don't know yet how he made the first contact with him. Yeah, and I mean, the internet's usually right. Uh, so Mace Windu <laughs> yeah. is Snoke. So therefore, we have a lot to fill in there because Mace Windu is Snoke. Right, right, right. No. So I don't know. I, I, it, it's interesting to think. Um, I like all the the literature going around in the canon books and just what we can fill in from the Force Awakens novelization sure. on... I like the idea of him being in contact as a boy. Mm-hmm. And so that fills in some blanks for me, like like almost like Palpatine when he met Anakin and Phantom Menace. Right. I'm gonna keep my eye on you. Like, ooh, do we know? We, like, cause we don't know who Snoke is. So who, how did he get there? It's it's fascinating, but yeah, we don't, we don't know. And I hope we get that in eight. John? Uh, one thing to keep in mind too, the term boy is very loose. I mean, did I believe the emperor referred to uh, Luke as boy as, oh, yeah. as yeah. one oh, yeah. too. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, so what does that mean? We don't really know. So it's a very, very loose age. Could you, could be just about anything. But the official answer to the question is no, they have not revealed to us yet how Snoke has come in contact with uh, Ben. Yeah, I would love to know more about this, and I have a feeling we're going to get to know more about this when we actually get the identity of Snoke, but just, Mm -hmm. you know, going around on the internet, which isn't always accurate, and I also didn't read the novelization of The Force Awakens. The part that intrigued me most was just that, you know, Leia was aware of Snoke's potential influence on Ben and kept it from Han, so that whole dynamic there sounds really interesting to me and, like, something that... Some movie or book or something should explore in the very near future. Oh, I'm sure we will. Once mm-hmm. we get a little bit more, that that's one of the things I'm really excited about with episode eight is all the stuff we will get, the novels and stuff that come out afterwards because there's yeah. so much they can't reveal yet. You're going to get a Luke Skywalker novel after episode eight. Once he gives you all the information of where he's been and what's happening, yeah. you're going to get so much more information. I cannot wait for that. So and we're really not that far away. Uh, okay. What's next? Uh, Ryan Fennelly writes, what's more likely, Snoke is Plagueis or Luke is Rey's father? It's a tough one. I mean, if you would have asked me right after I saw episode seven, I would have said, yeah, it's probably the fact that Rey is Luke's daughter. I'm going the other way this one. I think that they have been throwing you off the scent of the Plagueis thing. I don't necessarily think that Plagueis is anymore. There are two theories that I used to buy into pretty heavily at one point, but I will say that 
to me, the more likely one right now is that Plagueis is uh, Snoke. I think that's the best theory still out of all the Snoke theories. Out of the 4,727 <laughs> Snoke theories out there, I still think the Plagueis one is the best one. Perry? I don't think either right. is accurate, but if I had to pick between the two, I guess I'd pick Snoke as Plagueis at this point. But I'm so frustrated with the Snoke theories that I'm at the point where I just don't care and I'm just not going to try to guess which one winds up being the real thing. And I'm just going to keep hoping for the ones that I like the best yeah. myself. John? Well, I don't necessarily believe in the uh, Plagueis is Snoke theory anymore. Yeah. It is by far the more likely. I, like, I think it is by far the more likely because I believe there's like zilch chance that Luke is Ray's dad. And I still believe, just like we were saying, despite being thrown off the trail, despite even straight up denials, and again, I don't. I no longer subscribe to the theory because I did once, but I no longer subscribe to the theory that Plague is a Snoke. But if out of the two, your question is which one is more likely? It's more likely that Snoke is Plague is. Right? Yeah, same. Uh, out of the two, I fell off the. I for a while I thought Ray was Luke's daughter, and then I thought she was Han and Leia's, and now I think she's just Ray. Yeah. Um, I I still would love to see Plague uh, be Snoke. That would make a lot of sense to me and the more likely of the theories if I were to choose between the two. But at the end of the day, I'm with all of you. I don't think either of them are correct. Yeah. All right, last one. Last one is from Miguel Abuel. Will we ever see a story take place before episode one? Ever? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Now, you're asking stories, so I'm assuming you mean anywhere. Um, we're all hoping and praying that the Knights of the Republic will become, A, a canon video game again. That would be great. Uh, B, a Netflix series. Or anything that could happen before episode one would be. And actually, you know what? We're going to get something before a story before episode one because we're getting that Yoda comic. Mm -hmm. And that Yoda comic is going to explore just before the events of episode mm -hmm. one. So now, if you're asking as far as films go, as for what Bob Iger says, we're getting Star Wars movies for as long as we can see. So they have so much time. And I think it'd be kind of a crime to not explore before episode one. I want to hear more about it. So, yeah, I think eventually we're definitely going to get one before episode one. Riley? Yeah, I I mean, I, I immediately go to Old Republic um, yeah. because that's before episode one, So, and that's the one I want the most. But it would be fascinating to see a story that takes place um, a little sooner. Or, yeah. Not necessarily Old Republic, uh, Republic, but like a movie that sets up, I don't know, um, Palpatine even, um, you know, in his early that. rise. But... Yes, I think there's so many stories worthy of telling that we could even get a series or surely more books, but I would love, I hope it's an Old Republic movie. That's what I would want. John? Old Republic. I think yeah. I think that's, I, I, I am very confident that is already on their radar. Yeah. I believe yeah. Old Republic era stuff is on their radar. I believe it's going to happen within three years. We're going to, not, not a movie released, but an announcement within three years, we're going to get Old Republic stuff. Harry? I like the sound of that. I'm all yeah. for that at this point. But yeah, we have the, the Yoda comic on the way, and yep. I looked up another one. as a short story called A Recipe for Death about... Uh, the disappearance of a sous chef working at Maz Kanata's castle. And, you know, when you have a character like Maz in play right now, yeah, that kind of hints that we're probably yeah. going to go back. I mean, yep. look what we were just talking about before with uh, Ben Solo and Snoke. That teeny little bit of time has so much stuff to mine and explore. This is, uh, like, who knows how much material it could be before episode one. Yep. So I think we're going to get it pretty soon, too. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, that's the show for today. Thank you for joining us on Collider Je Jedi Council. I'd like to thank the council who joined us today. First, Mark Yodi Riley, where can people find you? You can find me at Riley Around on Twitter and Instagram. And tomorrow, taking on, I forget his name, uh, John? Jim. Jim? Sam. I don't know. He wears a mask, and he's just got a big mouth. So I'm taking him on the Schmo down tomorrow. Check it out. That's going to be a lot of fun. And then on Tuesdays, Collider Nightmares, of course. I love it there. All the horror news for you guys. Check me out there. Obi-John Kenobi, John Campia. I just thought of Roka's new Star Wars Jedi Council name. What is it? Uh, John Snoka. John Snoka. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> there you go. Snoke. You guys yeah. can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter and Instagram. Simply at John Campy. And make sure you subscribe to Comic Con HQ, where mine and John Schnepp show Film HQ airs every Saturday. Grand Moff. 
Never you off. guys can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at PNemroff. Collider Nightmares every Tuesday, best of the week every Saturday. And for me, you can find me here every Thursday. You can find me on Movie Talk and the Schmodown. Like Mark Riley said, tomorrow's the big one. It's the semifinal match between Mark Yodi Riley and John Roca. The winner takes on Baby Carrots himself, Mark Ellis, in the finals. That's coming up. And then next week is a very special Schmodown. We have Olympian Cody Miller going up against Little Evil JTE. Make mm-hmm. sure you check that out guys thank you so much for joining us we'll see you next time may the force be with you always hey guys if you like this video click the thumbs up button also make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel it'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at collider